Hello everyone, welcome to NPTEL Rural Water Resource Management course, week four, lecture four. In this week, we have been focusing on groundwater hydrology. And you would have noticed that we are looking at mostly how the groundwater comes into the system, how it gets relocated to different compartments, unconfined, confined, et cetera. We looked at recharge and how delayed recharge can happen. And we also discussed about farmers pumping and how that could actually take more water out uh, than needed if you're not considerate about neighboring farmers. In today's lecture, we would be looking at the types of aquifers based on the geology in India, Indian aquifers. So the Indian aquifers, as per the government, books on and reports on groundwater hydrology, uh, you would notice that it is mostly based on the geology. So the major types of Indian aquifers are only two types, the major ones, uh, hard rock aquifers of peninsula India, uh, which represents uh, about 65% of India's overall aquifer surface. If you take 100% as India's aquifer surface, uh, you have the hard rock aquifers as around 65%. Most of them are found in central peninsular India uh, because that is where you have these hard rock geology. Um, hard rock, uh, as the name suggests, it is a rock which has not been fully disintegrated into soil or uh, unconsolidated materials and minerals. Uh, still, there is a lot of consolidated rocks. And within the rocks, there could be a lot of fractures, and that is where the water is stored. And as they clearly say, land is typically underlined by hard rock formation. So the geology, which is the formation, drives the aquifer name. And it gives uh, rise to complex and extensive low storage aquifer systems. It is very, very low in storage. So when you hit a hard rock aquifer, storage um, and then you put a pump uh, hit means when you drill in and hit it uh, what happens is you actually tap into a water which has been there for a millennia or at least 100 years and your understanding is oh wow i've taken groundwater now i've accessed groundwater let me take it all it will recharge but it won't because of the complexity the hard rock aquifers and it is very low in storage. So the storage you see, the volume you see, it might be the total volume. It may not recharge. So when you pull all of it out within a year or two, you have depleted your aquifer. Wherein the water level tends to drop very rapidly once the water table falls by two to six meters. So studies have noted that if the water table is lower across the region by two to six meters, suddenly the water table fluctuates and comes down to very unsustainable levels. Think about the cone of depression. So you have many cone of depressions now. And so slowly it, it is did, lowering down two meters, three meters. But once it hits around two to six meters, suddenly the water level falls. Um, and additionally, these aquifers have poor permeability, permeability of letting the water go through the substrate system. Uh, and that is why it is limited uh, recharge through rainfall. You cannot achieve much rainfall through just rainfall. When, when the author says recharge through rainfall, which means natural recharge, you can augment it, but still very, very less is going to happen. So this implies the water in these aquifers is non-replenishable and eventually dry out due to continuous usage. So this is the water, which is approximately 65% of across India. And so it is very, very important to preserve this natural resource, okay? And um, uh, if you do not understand on the um, availability of the water, how the process is happening, people tend to just use it because if they don't use it, the next farmer will use it. That mentality is also there. So if you go to rural regions, they will say, sir, if I do not use my groundwater, someone else will use it. Okay, so that 
concern is also there and that is why we are pushing as a group to convert more into communal groundwater usage wherein everyone is accountable for how much groundwater they use. The second type of major uh, Indian aquifers uh, is alluvial aquifers of the Indo-Gangetic Plains. Uh, the author claims that Indo-Gangetic Plains uh, is one of the uh, aquifers, but it is uh, overall an alluvial aquifer. What is an alluvial aquifer? The geology is alluvium or is deposited by your rivers and moving water bodies. These aquifers found in the Ganges and in the uh, plains in northern India have significant storage space because every year you have sedimentations. So once the sediment layer is going thickening every year, water can get stored in it and hence a valuable source of fresh water supply. How would you do excessive groundwater extraction and low recharge rates? These aquifers are at risk of irreversible overexploitation. So the recharge rates are still low, that, that is the natural recharge rate. When you compare to hard rock aquifers, the recharge is much, much better. And, uh, and because of the better hydraulic conductivity, permeability, et cetera. But the point here to be noticed is that these plains already have good water in terms of surface water, the Ganges, the Indus. These are one of the biggest rivers in the world, right? So if you're looking at these rivers, uh, and uh, saying that uh, people are still using groundwater, which means the demand side has to be managed, not the supply side. So if you're having a big river, but still you're saying it's not enough and you're going to groundwater, so there is some concern of how you use the water. Whereas in northern regions, you have these Ganges, Indus Plains, but when you go to southern regions, there's not much big rivers. Kaveri, Krishna, all are much, much smaller compared to the Ganges. So what would people do in the South if they don't have such a volume? So they are going into groundwater depletion. So that should not be happening in the North uh, regions where you have these Ganges plains, uh, but unfortunately groundwater is being depleted. So there has to be a better understanding of why the water is used. Is it sustainable in the long term? or are we just looking at short-term benefits? Let's look at the principal aqua systems as given by uh, Central Groundwater Board. Uh, they have uh, labeled uh, many uh, in terms of um, the aquifers. And uh, what you could see here is um, your um, aquifers are alluvial along the Indus Ganges Plain. Also, you would see aquifers uh, alluvial aquifers along the coast where the rivers drain because when the rivers move and drain into the oceans they bring a lot of sediments and the sediments become the alluvium material alluvium uh, aquifer so you see all these uh, waterways depositing alluvium across and then going into bangladesh etc so this is the brahmaputra bringing in a lot of alluvium your brahma your ganges your indus so all these big big rivers bring in a lot of alluvium and then you have your Krishna and Admada all on the, on the coastal sites, you would see Kaveri uh, giving water on the coastal, uh, like discharging water into the ocean along the coast, uh, but also they would deposit the sediment and form deltas. So those alluvium aquifers are highly rechargeable compared to hard rock aquifers. And the central area, central regions were granite, mostly granite, uh, Nisus, we call it G N E I S S. So, Nisus granites are hard rocks formed from metaphoric formations um, and uh, they do not give in that much groundwater because the pore space is very, very limited. It's not the rock opposing, it's not hydrophobic. It is because the spore space is much limited and these rocks are not as weathered as the Himalayan regions. Okay. So you'd see rocks, but it's not as weathered. So what happens is only when weathering happens, you have a space for the water to um, get. So these are also based on the geological survey maps from the geological survey of India. Uh, and uh, we can see a generalized geological map here. So quaternary are much, much younger geology. And those are the sediment uh, driven, alluvium, colluvium driven deposits. So you could see a lot of these materials along the river valleys, the big, big river valleys. Whereas the central India is Jurassic, Paracene, volcanic rocks um, and uh, all the pink color 
uh, you see upper Paleozoic and lower uh, Cretaceous continental rocks. So all these are still from the Himalayan regions, uh, you can see of the Himalayas, uh, and they are not that much weathered in terms of becoming into uh, porous sediments, porous soil. It is still a hard rock, and the hard rock is characterized by fractures. The fractures, first a rock is there, fractures form, and then the fractures, uh, water and sunlight act upon, and then it disintegrates into soil materials. So still there's a lot of hard rock aquifers here, uh, which also is a concern that water cannot be stored in a longer time. So now if you look both of these maps together, you would see that uh, the aquifer mapped aquifer system uh, mapped by the Central Groundwater Board uh, also follows the geology uh, uh, system. So the geology is the key. Along with that, your Indus River and other river basins, Ganges, etc., together form these principal aquifer systems of India. And it is mostly divided based on the yield. Uh, water can be yielded from these aquifers. Now, if you see this, uh, you do have uh, a rainfall uh, variable also. It's not only the groundwater, it's not only the rivers, but also good rainfall. So if you have your Western Ghats area, your Ganges regions, you have good rainfall, good uh, storm water in terms of runoff. Uh, all these are, are, are there. So not much dependency you could see uh, to groundwater, but what happens in the central and southern regions uh, where there's much, much lesser rainfall um, uh, and also not big rivers flowing, uh, you would have to see that most farmers go into groundwater irrigation because they have to do livelihood options for agriculture, domestic, urban cities. Everyone uses groundwater in the central and southern regions. You saw the geology map, which is purely based on the rock material, the rock formations, the more much, much deeper formations. So when you say quaternary Jurassic uh, period, it is not on the top, but on the very, very high depth. Uh, so that, that's where also you have some um, formations. Uh, but when you look at a hydrogeological map, it is the hydrology plus the geology map, which is made uh, by Central Groundwater Board. You could see alluvium and confined um, aquifers, uh, hard rock aquifers along this uh, Indian subcontinent, uh, and out of which uh, alluvium and unconfined uh, major aquifer systems contribute to 31% of the area. Okay, so the alluvium is here, your blue color, and your unconfined, which is your top uh, aquifers, uh, where uh, unconfined and it is unconsolidated, which is mean it's broken formations. Uh, those uh, do occupy the light blue and blue colors. Uh, it, and it is along the river basins, along the deltas where the rivers discharge. Um, and it is seen mostly across India uh, in the northern regions, right? And that is accounts to 31%, but the major, major part is your hard rock and semi-consolidated and unconsolidated rocks. Uh, so the rock area which uh, is present in the central southern regions um, are the dominant aquifer type in India. So if you uh, want to map it by yield, the high yielding aquifers are on the alluvium aquifers and on the northern side, uh, whereas your central India, southern India is characterized by low yielding formations. You could leave Kashmir uh, and uh, other hilly regions out because most of those regions, you don't see much agricultural activities, but I'm talking about the central basin and, and all the other smaller river basins in India, uh, where you have so much agricultural activity, but very, very less groundwater potential. This uh, knowledge has to be imparted to the farmers because they, when they put a well, they think that, oh, there's unlimited supply of water, uh, but they don't understand that the yield would suddenly stop because everyone starts pumping. And uh, as the yield is increasing, the recharge, if it doesn't increase, uh, the water will fall down drastically, the water table. 
So there are uh, multiple uh, studies that have been done uh, um, to see how these basins, how they recharge, how they um, uh, discharge water. And uh, one particular uh, study from Europe showcases that um, the unconsulted aquifers, where uh, you have a little bit more weathered uh, formation, uh, you could see very high recharge. Uh, very high recharge along the Ganges, and you could see if you if you visualize uh, further into this figure, you could see that high recharge is happening along the river channels, along the major tributaries, uh, and that clearly shows that when the Ganges is flowing, it also can recharge, and which also relates to the Ganges water machine that we discussed earlier. So there is high recharge, uh, approximately greater than three hundred millimeters per year. Just think about this number 300 millimeters, whereas the rainfall here is only around 600 millimeters, 600, 700 millimeters. So that's a big number just because of groundwater, you're getting 300 millimeters of recharge. Uh, and then you have your high recharge areas. So you have your very high along the Ganges, along the tributaries, along the Krishna Kaveri tributary. Uh, and also you have high recharge, medium recharge, all still in the river basins, which is the alluvial aquifers. Okay, then when you come to the complex crystalline aquifers, which is mostly found uh, in the central regions, uh, you have uh, very high recharge in some regions where there's good forest cover, good networks of um, uh, rivers, tributaries, and also a lot of rainfall. So do think that recharge can happen only when you have a good material, but also you need the rainfall. You cannot have a recharge without rainfall. So that is what this is actually bringing in the hydrological concept also. Then you have the medium recharge in central India and southern India and very low uh, to very, uh, very, very low recharge are less than 20 millimeters per year uh, along pockets. And these are the pockets where you have the shadow region of the Western Ghats. And you see that the Western Ghats is a dark green in color, which is very, very high recharge because there's a lot of rainfall the Western Ghats comes along this angle, there's a lot of rainfall, and then it deposits along the Western Ghats, Kerala, Maharashtra, Konkan region, etc. On the other side of the Western Ghats, Vidarbha, and if you come to Tamil Nadu, uh, you would see that there's very, very less rainfall, and due to that, there's less recharge. Okay, and then there's minor groundwater basins, uh, which are also found in Gujarat and um, these are small groundwater basins uh, formed by uh, unique differences in the geological material. So this uh, image actually clarifies more that you need to understand the geology, you need to understand the hydrology, where in where do the rivers flow, where are the tributaries, uh, where is the deposition happening uh, to understand uh, geological formations and aquifer potential. Uh, and also the rainfall regions. So the aquifer's yield is based on your geology because that is the first one where you can create a pore space. The second is the availability of water either through rainfall, which is your hydroclimate, uh, your rainfall occurring regions, high rainfall occurring regions would have more rainfall to infiltrate. And then the third is your hydrology based aquifers, wherein along the tributaries, along the tributaries and channels, you have a higher yielding aquifers. Okay. So, also, uh, if you have a higher yielding aquifers, which means more recharge is happening, but are they getting into the aquifer too fast? If they do get too fast, then there's more interactions between the geological material. And that is what you find along the Ganges, that there is a lot of natural pollutants in the groundwater because there's a lot of arsenic, which is a natural pollutant. Uh, and along the Ganges, if you have polluted water coming in and the Yamuna, etc., uh, because of the high recharge, uh, it is not always good. Because the high recharge rate is there, you have to protect the water that goes into these aquifers. If you do not maintain the quality, it's not only quantity that is important in groundwater, also quality. If you do not maintain the quality, then the groundwater will be easily polluted in these regions. So now that is 
uh, a concern for a high recharge area. High recharge is good, but also if you do not maintain the quality of the water that is going in, you are actually polluting the aquifer faster. For example, let's take a case study. If you have uh, polluting agents here, let's say industry, tannery, uh, dyeing industry for clothes in, in southern parts, and the water is put in the streams, the recharge is very low, only 20 to 100 millimeters per year. So only some pollutants are getting in, but if the same goes in the Ganges, uh, then think about how much water is recharging the groundwater and all this groundwater has the potential to bring down the quality of your groundwater. So when we do groundwater hydrology, when we talk about groundwater use for uh, rural environments, it is as important to talk about the quality uh, as we talk about the quantity because black arsenic, dead end, or pollutant uh, water cannot be used for uh, agriculture, right? You don't use salt water in agriculture, right? So the same way, if your groundwater is polluted, you cannot use. So it is as important to maintain the recharge and maintain good quality recharge along these areas. Um, and whenever there's a flood, uh, these tributaries do have a backlog of all the flooded water uh, and the flood can actually infiltrate uh, and pollute your aquifers. So in Kerala, where there's annual level floods every year and Maharashtra, Mumbai, for example, uh, if you do not maintain the flood water and you are sitting in a zone where high recharge is there, the flood water once polluted can enter into the groundwater aquifer and pollute the entire system. Unlike your surface hydrology, uh, where it's easier to clean the river if it is polluted. Uh, because for example, if a river is polluted, people would just let it dry or a big flood can push all the pollutants away. But in groundwater, it's not the case. Once a groundwater recharge occurs, it stays there. You cannot pull all the pollutants out because the polluting uh, agents might be stuck with the soil and it stays there forever. So it is as important to understand the recharge areas uh, and also maintain the water that goes into the recharge areas, high recharge areas, to get good groundwater availability. And this is very, uh, thinking about the long-term sustainable, this is a very, very important goal that we should attain to uh, preserve groundwater. With this, I'll stop uh, today's lecture. Uh, let's uh, get into the last next lecture for the wrap-up of groundwater hydro. Thank you.